posterior portion of the fish, and they kind of uh, arc, there's a kind of an arc of, of spot freeness, um, and then kind of taper out onto the uh, head. But we see quite a bit of morphological variation, uh, even just within our small area of north central Montana. Uh, the top fish is uh, from the Judith River Basin, and you kind of see some of this orange and um, kind of larger spotting. Uh, but this fish on the bottom is actually from the Sun River drainage, and this is kind of typical of the front where you see a lot more paler kind of fish. Um, they do a really good uh, job of kind of blending in with their environment. So on the front where you have a lot of these limestone dominated kind of watersheds, a lot of white rocks, clear water, not a lot of aquatic veg, kind of get a little paler fish. And then this is a, this one from the Smith River drainage, just kind of show you some of the range of the, the morphological variation that we have in our populations. Really, it's just an excuse to dump a bunch of fish photos that I, want, that I like. So, um, yeah, these are some other ones. This is a Judith River Basin fish, a Teton River fish, and um, the Bell Creek over here. So, West Hill cutthroat trout were originally one of the most widely distributed subspecies of cutthroat trout. Um, the core of their range kind of centered along the Idaho Montana border. Um, this figure actually comes from a genetics paper that these different Colors represent different lineages, sort of within the subspecies, but we really won't get into that. But um, the range extends, you know, from uh, Salmon River drainage in Idaho up into the Kootenai in, in um, Canada, and then you have some disjunct populations in British Columbia, uh, the east slope of the Washington Cascades, and then the John Day River Basin, uh, kind of a little separated. Uh, one thing to point out though is, yeah, the, uh, they are native to the east side. The Continental Divide and the uh, um, Upper Missouri River drainage here, pictured in green, kind of grouped out as one uh, unique kind of lineage when we look at the genetics of them, and it indicates that um, West Slope Cutthroat Trout probably gained access one time. Kind of all the populations that we see on the east side of the Continental Divide share a common haplotype in their mitochondrial DNA, and the Two Medicine River drainage actually plays an incredibly important role in this story. Um, it's most likely pre uh, presumed that West Hill Cutthroat Trout across the Continental Divide at Marias Pass, you know, from Bear Creek in the Middle Fork Flathead drainage into Summit Creek at Summit Lake. And it was even noted that Summit Lake drained both drainages, and it wasn't until the Great Northern Railroad dammed Summit Lake that it kind of cut off that historical access. But um, this is kind of an aside, but, you know, as West Hill Cutthroat Trout came down the uh, the two medicine, they probably came out onto the plains and into a, a, a scene similar to this of like Colombian mammoths and bison antiquis and these really large glacial lakes that sat at the foot of the Cordillerian ice sheet. Um, and this is how, you know, basically West Coast Cutter Trout would have come down, they would have came into Glacial Lake Cut Bank, traveled along these rivers and lakes at the foot of the glaciers, um, gotten into Glacial Lake Great Falls, and then from there radiated into the entire Upper Missouri River drainage. Um, Kind of uh, stuff I find fascinating, kind of where the paleoecology and geology all kind of come together to help influence fish distribution. But so, as I mentioned, um, kind of the core of the habitat is centered along that Idaho Montana border. Um, in this figure, we have a historically occupied habitat in gray, and then the current occupied habitat in this purple color. Um, <laughs> And you kind of see right along that border, the core of the habitat is relatively intact. There's a lot of purple. Uh, but when you start looking out to the periphery um, in the Cascades and the John Day, and especially on the east side of the Continental Divide, you see a lot more gray, a lot more disjunct populations. And when we look at just our non-hybridized populations, these kind of represent kind of the aboriginal fish that was here before any non-native fish were stocked. Um, you really get the appreciation for kind of that, just how disjunct these populations have become, how isolated from each other they are. Um, and then if we just zoom in on, on our management area in north central Montana, they're really few and far between. And um, it's estimated in the entire upper Missouri River drainage, uh, West Slope Cutthroat Trout, a non high rise population, is occupying only about 8% of their historical habitat. And so when we think about, you know, what caused these great declines in West Slope Cutthroat Trout distribution east of the Continental Divide, um, 
certainly all the, the typical players that you would assume, you know, with changing land use practices, logging, uh, hard rock mining, overgrazing, overexploitation, all probably played a role in some way. But from a habitat standpoint, you know, we're pretty lucky in north central Montana, especially in the, in the Tumas and River drainage, our habitat's relatively pristine. pristine. Um, this is a look up at the creek before the fires. Um, but, and, and that's thanks in large parts of groups like this that have fought so long, you know, for, to protect places like the, the Badger Two Med. Um, and if we really had to kind of boil down why we've seen such precipitous decline in muscle cutthroat trout, it comes from non-native species. If we could wave a magic wand and have, have it that there were no non-native species, but every other kind of stressor that, hap as, that has happened today was still here, we wouldn't be worried about muscle cut their child. They'd be doing just fine. Um, so it's kind of the definition of a limiting factor, unfortunately. And non-native species impact muscle cut their child populations primarily through two pathways. Um, one being competition and predation. Um, so pictured up on top is the eastern bird trout native to the Appalachian and the east coast of the US. Um, Bird trout are excellent at outcompeting our native muscle cutthroat trout. They're fall spawners. <coughs> they deposit their eggs in the gravel in um, late September, early November. Those embryos overwinter and they hatch out in uh, early spring. Our native muscle cutthroat trout are spring spawners. They spawn in the late spring, early summer. Those embryos develop over summer, hatch out in late summer, early fall. So when they hatch out, bird trout have hatched out two to three months before them, they have such a jump on them, they, they're able to pack on pounds. So when these little baby cutthroat come out of the gravel, there's these brook trout um, that are just able to outcompete them, they're larger than them, and then they can also outright feed on them. <laughs> but probably the most insidious kind of way that non-native fish have influenced our native cutthroat trout populations is through intragressive hybridization. So pictured down here at the bottom is a rainbow trout, um, you know, uh, rainbow trout and cutthroat trout shared a common ancestor probably maybe about six million years ago. It's relatively close, evolutionarily speaking, so they can fully interbreed with each other, produce fertile offspring that can continue interbreeding. And that's typically what we see uh, all over our region. Is when rainbow trout come into a system and they begin the process of hybridization, um, basically what happens is they keep interbreeding to a point where you no longer have um, non-hybridized individuals of either parental species, and you get what's called a hybrid swarm. And this is deleterious for a number of reasons. We've been able to document reduced fitness in, in hybrids and reduced uh, or increased rates of straying. Um, and basically what happens is you just get genomic extinction of that population. You can lose those locally adapted gene complexes that have developed over the past 10,000 years. And so the state recognized kind of this decline in muscle cutthroat trout, and one of the first measures that was taken in the 70s, it was listed as a state species of special concern. This is kind of when we start seeing conservation actions taken um, across the state for uh, muscle cutthroat trout. Uh, fast forward to 1997 is when we um, get petitioned uh, for, the subspecies gets petitioned for listing as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. And then in 2000, uh, the state develops, kind of more formalizes a, a um, method for conservation. We develop what's called a, a status and restoration strategy document in the year 2000. And that same year, the Fish and Wildlife Service determined that listing wasn't warranted, based primarily on a lot of the work that agencies like the uh, state of Montana and, and our federal and tribal partners um, had, had done working to restore the species. Um, that finding was challenged again in 2003, but that same year it was found that, um, it, again, it wasn't warranted. And then in 2007, kind of most recently, we developed our Memorandum of Understanding and Conservation Agreement, which kind of guides uh, both Wessel Cutthroat Trout and Yellowstone, Yellowstone Cutthroat Trout conservation in the state. So right now, in our statewide fisheries management plan, our stated goal for Wessel Cut West Slope Cutthroat Trout Conservation on the east side of the Continental Divide is um, 
to restore secure conservation populations to 20% of the historic distribution. So I kind of have to define a couple things here. Uh, conservation population of West Slope cutthroat trout would be anyone that uh, tests genetically of at least 90% of West Slope cutthroat trout genetic uh, ancestry. And then a secure conservation population, uh, the criteria that that's set for that is you have to have a large population of around 2,500 fish. Uh, it occupies sufficient habitat to persist into the, the future, so that's typically around five to six as a minimum uh, miles. And then it has to be physically isolated from non-native fish. Um, so within the two Madison River drainage, you know, we have uh, our estimated historically occupied habitat is around 620 miles. So 20% of that uh, of that historic um, mileage would be 124, so that'd be our sub basin goal. And so currently, we are pretty sure we have about 88 uh, miles of conservation populations that we have identified in the Two Madison River drainage. And of those 88, probably only 30 are considered secure. So we have a lot of way, a long ways to go um, to reach our goals within the Two Madison River drainage. And unfortunately, you know, we just don't have all the resources to be able to um, to really, you know, pursue every conservation action that we would like to. Uh, and we have to prioritize um, the way we go about uh, restoring West Slope cutthroat trout. So this is in our memorandum of understanding in the statewide fisheries management plan, and it kind of this is our priority uh, action. Uh, kind of layout for, for Wessel Cutler Trout Conservation where the highest priority populations are, are, or our highest priority actions are to protect and secure our genetically and our unaltered populations. You know, they represent that aboriginal, um, what was here 200 years ago, um, kind of the best of the best from a genetic standpoint. And then kind of moving to our, um, their next highest priority would be replication of those genetically unaltered populations. So to make sure they're redundant on the landscape. So, you know, they're often isolated in these small populations. We don't lose them to stochastic events. Um, and then uh, on that same tier is to protect and secure our genetically um, altered conservation populations. And then at, at the lower end of the priority would be replication of those genetically altered populations. So I mentioned one of the criteria for uh, secu securing a conservation population is it has to be physically isolated from non-native fish. And typically we can do this in uh, one of two ways. We can take advantage of uh, the natural barriers that uh, are out there on the landscape already. So this is Lang Falls on Lang Creek and the Sun River drainage. This is the site of one of our restoration projects. Um, we can, uh, 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 yeah, replicate populations in fishless habitat above natural barriers or find streams that have these natural barriers and if there are non-native trout above them, we can move forward with the reclamation project. Uh, another way is we can construct fish barriers and we do this um, uh, not as frequently uh, as we used to because uh, the rising cost of construction is making um, barriers such as this a lot more economically um, challenging to, to do, but uh, this is a, a fish barrier we installed on uh, Dry Fork and Bell Creek. Um, and so, you know, moving forward in the future, we're going to have to be really uh, conscientious about where we put these these uh, fish barriers and kind of where we can get the most bang for our buck. And um, it's unfortunate, but uh, it is a uh, you know one of the methods that we that we use to isolate uh, or cut our trout populations. So once we've isolated a population and, it, and there are non-native fish above uh, said barrier, then we can move forward kind of with a reclamation project and um, to remove those non-native trout. We basically have one of two met or we have basically two methods: uh, mechanical removal, uh, so using backpack electrofishing. If you're not familiar with backpack electrofishing, it's pretty much a standard way of sampling small stream habitats that we have in North Central Montana. It's basically a battery powered backpack. It introduces electrical shock into the stream. We're able to temporarily stun fish, net them up, and then we can remove non-natives if we're doing a removal project. But 
the kind of suite of uh, <laughs> characteristics where this is successful is it's pretty narrow. You need a, a, a beautiful stream like this where it's like, wow, not a willow in sight, excellent uh, uh, visibility, um, really high cache probability. Like this would be a good candidate for a mechanical removal stream. But unfortunately, uh, a lot of our streams look like this, <laughs> where there's a lot of large woody debris, very complex habitat. Our ability to successfully physically remove all non-native fish from a stream like this is, is very low. So uh, we do have to use um, pesticides. We use EPA-registered pesticides, such as rope known, to, to re chemically reclaim streams. And then uh, once we remove non-native fish, we can move forward with our uh, wessel pepper trout uh, introduction or, or restoration. These are incredibly complex, logistically complex projects, and a ton of work goes into them on the front end. We, when we find a project area that we think is a good candidate for wessel pepper trout restoration, we go in and we map every seat, every spring, every side channel, every little off-channel pool. We map it out, we do dive flow studies, so we get an understanding of uh, flow rates uh, from all the different uh, streams, tributary systems. Uh, we take flow measurements at every major you know, tributary junction all along the main stem. This all allows us to precisely calculate the amount of chemical that we need to successfully to treat the area and not you know, use more than we, than we need to. And then also, uh, you know, on all these projects, we have a detoxification station at the bottom of the project area. All these measurements go into helping us calculate the exact amount of chemical we need and the, and the exact amount of uh, detoxifying agent we need so we can precisely apply it, um, our pesticides and then detox it and it neutralizes it. And then we don't have any downstream impacts from them. A lot of work goes into these projects, and we, you know, we really do have incredible staff in this agency. I've personally worked on projects where, you know, we've had biologists from Canada, from Norway, come because they want to learn from us because we do really have some of the most knowledgeable, knowledgeable people in pulling off projects like this. Yeah. How does, um, I know you have a detox process for the pesticides, but yeah. how would for example, if an animal ate a fish that was killed by pesticide, would that double up the food chain, or how would that? No, so the um, rope gnome, the chemical that we use, is uh, it's naturally derived from the roots of legume plants that occur in uh, South America and Southeast Asia. Um, and an active ingredient in the chemical formulations that we use is only 5%. Um, we're treating, so an effective, an effective uh, treatment rate for uh, salmonids, like getting rid of bird trout and rainbow trout, is typically one part per million. And the, that's the, the great thing about uh, rope known is that it, it readily breaks down and the treatment levels that we treat at are so low that they virtually have no impact on uh, you know, from drinking or eating, you know, they don't really, they don't affect mammal populations. You do see, you know, we do have to be careful about amphibian populations. They're a little more sensitive um, just because of the way they absorb, uh, you know, their, their skin and they're just, it's a little more sensitive there, but for mammalians, for birds, you know, for people, you would die from drinking too much water before you would have any sort of um, ill effects from the world. Yeah. So that's kind of a history of kind of how we manage for Wessel Cutthroat Trout. Um, now I kind of just want to transition to uh, the two nights and river drainage. Uh, as of now, we have 16 total conservation populations that we've identified within uh, the drainage, um, pictured here in, in red. Um, of those, uh, we have seven genetically unaltered, but I have an asterisk here. You know, the field of genetics has advanced so rapidly, even within the past 10 years, that a lot of uh, the populations that we thought were unaltered maybe even 10 years ago, we can look at the genome in such a uh, more, you know, um, finite and cl clear way that 
we're finding a lot of those populations we thought were unaltered are very slightly hybridized. And so I have it listed as seven here, but in reality, it could be maybe around three or two even. But um, yeah, and then of those populations, one is for sure secure, that meets that secure criteria. And that would be the North Badger Creek um, meta population. You know, it's a large stream network of a, isolated by a waterfall barrier, um, you know, maybe around 19, 20 miles of interconnected stream habitat. So I'll give a rundown of um, kind of the previous projects that have taken place in, in the Two Medicine River drainage as far as West Slope Trout Trout Conservation goes. And that starts off with uh, the South Fork of Birch Creek. So uh, South Fork of Birch Creek, one of the tributaries of Swift Reservoir, um, back in the 70s, it, it, as you move upstream from, from Swift Reservoir, there's a series of waterfall barriers uh, located kind of near the Fallen Creek confluence. Uh, and back in the 70s, it was determined that this stream was fishless above, and it would be a great place to uh, um, replicate West Slope Cutthroat Trout. So, uh, back in 1974, 171 West Oak were collected from the North Fork of Little Bell Creek in the Highwood Mountains, uh, just outside of Great Falls, um, were helicoptered over and released into the upper drainage. Uh, they occupied about 5.3 miles of habitat. And this is one that, you know, we planted them in the 70s, we went back in the 90s, and I think it was 1995 where we took a look at the genetics and they were still non hybridized. Um, but really, since you know almost 50 years ago, there hasn't been a lot that's gone on, and that's kind of one of the things I want to get into in the coming years is uh, do a little more demographic monitoring, see how that population is doing, because it's very likely that this is also meets a secured criteria. There's probably well over 2,500 fish in this population. Um, one of the unfortunate things was uh, in the 90s it was discovered that. Um, in Lake Creek, there was a legal introduction of uh, brook trout that were placed in a kind of beaver pond lake habitat. And, uh, it's assumed that brook trout are, yeah, now uh, St. Patrick with the uh, West Slope Cutler trout in this lower reach of the stream. Um, so that was, yeah, 1974. If we move forward to the late 90s, uh, White Rock Creek is a headwater tributary of the South Fork Two Medicine River. Um, in the early 90s, genetic analysis of this population indicated it was not hybridized. Uh, the Forest Service came in and, and attempted to construct a log barrier in the lower drainage to isolate this population from um, hybrids, non-native fish moving up the South Fork Two Medicine River. Um, at the same time, in uh, Lonesome Creek, in the Badger Creek drainage, they identified a series of natural waterfall barriers that isolated Lonesome Creek, and it was um, determined to be an incredible place to, to try and uh, replicate the White Rock Creek population. So uh, in 2002 and two 2003, a total of 100 bustle cutthroat trout were transferred from White Rock Creek to Lonesome, where they established an uh, a pretty small section of stream, kind of just under a mile of habitat. There was an additional bedrock barrier upstream of the release site. So there is still quite a bit of habitat in Upper Lonesome Creek, and this is a place where we could um, potentially uh, expand this population to occupy a greater amount of habitat. Um, unfortunately, this is one of those populations where in the 90s, these fish looked not hybridized from our genetic analysis, but uh, we know now that uh, West Oak Cutthroat Trout and White Rock Creek are about 99.5% um, non hybridized Very slightly, but uh, still definitely a conservation population. Uh, similar to the White Rock to Lonesome transfer is the Sydney Creek to Woods transfer. So Sydney Creek, also in the headwaters of the South Fork Two Medicine, um, is the, about halfway up the drainage it's isolated by this bedrock barrier, and fish from above this are tested as non-hybridized. And then just across the South Fork Two Med uh, in Woods Creek, this large bedrock slide isolated the headwaters of this system, and it was fishless above. So it was identified as a, as a great place to replicate that Sydney Creek population. So uh, over a four-year period from 2013 to 2018, a total of 73 West Slope Cutthroat Trout were transferred. Um, 
that population at Sydney Creek is very small, so you know we had to do small transfers of 16 to 20 individuals a year to not uh, impact that donor population. But this is another one where we kind of need to go back into uh, update our demographic monitoring, see how well that um, Woods Creek population is established, and uh, um, take a look at their genetics as well. And kind of mo the most recent project that, that we've done in this area would be the Hyde Creek Reclamation Project. So Hyde Creek uh, is a tributary of the South Coast of Medicine. It's isolated by this large waterfall barrier that's basically right at the confluence of the South Fork to Medicine River and the upper six miles of habitat uh, were occupied solely by uh, brook trout. So in 2014, um, the stream was, was treated to remove non-native fish and then again in 2018 and 2019 to ensure uh, complete removal. In 2020, we backpacked electrofish, electrofish this entire system and confirmed that it was indeed fishless. And that same year, we helicoptered about 80 West Slope Cutthroat Trout from Lane Creek in the Sun River drainage to Hyde Creek and released them in Upper Hyde Creek. We got a good, uh, this is a length frequency uh, distribution of um, the West Slope Cutthroat Trout that we transferred. So we got a good uh, range of sizes with you know, some definite adults that are gonna be able to spawn that next year and a good, good amount of young fish to grow up into that, um, that empty habitat. But 80 is kind of on the lower end of where we like to start populations at. We typically try to shoot for 150 fish. So in the coming years, you know, we're gonna, I think this year actually, we're gonna go back into high, confirm uh, successful spawning from the transferred fish and then potentially look at some of the other uh, places we're gonna uh, put some more cover of trout in. So that kind of covers um, the history of conservation actions that have kind of taken place to date in the two medicine. Um, and now I kind of just want to talk about, I guess as I see it, what our priority actions are moving forward to protect uh, West Slope Cutthroat Trout and drainage. And so to me, the number one uh, priority watershed would be uh, Midvale Creek. Um, everyone's pretty familiar with Midvale right here in East Glacier, uh, isolated by the, uh, the water intake dam. Um, this population of Russell Cutler Trout above the dam uh, tested, um, you know, non-hybridized um, basically until 2009 when two hybrids were picked up. Uh, staff went out and took a look at, at the Midvale Creek population. I found a log jam in the slough escape of the dam that allowed hybrids to bypass the dam and begin the hybridization process in Midvale Creek. Um, and so unfortunately this has been ongoing since 2009. I know the, I believe the Park Service goes into Midvale and does some suppression of hybrids. Um, but we still are relatively early in this hybridization process. Uh, the headwaters of Midvale, uh, the West Hill Cutler Chart are predominantly non-hybridized and we still have an opportunity to kind of uh, replicate this lineage in fishless habitat elsewhere before the hybridization process continues to spread throughout the drainage. But every year that kind of window gets a little smaller. So this is uh, would be a really cool collaborative project to work with the, the Blackfeet uh, Tribe um, Department of Fish and Wildlife and the National Park Service um, to try and replicate this population somewhere else uh, to, to kind of make sure we preserve it for the, in, going into the future. Uh, similar to that, you know, I looked through all the genetic records from the entire drainage and found that um, there's a couple areas where we did find non-hybridized West Slope Cutthroat Trout still present even in the uh, presence of hybrids. And two areas that I kind of want to take a look at in this coming year is Lost Shirt Creek and um, the headwaters of the South Fork Two Medicine River. Uh, back in 2011, uh, genetic samples from both these creeks were largely non composed of non hybridized individuals with a few hybrids present. So it's another place we just need to go back into, uh, reanalyze the fish. If there's anything left non hybridized, try and find a place where we can replicate them because there's likely not uh, a good way to protect them in place. And similarly, uh, Pocket Creek, this is actually an unnamed tributary of the South Fork Two Med, uh, just uh, to the northeast of Metler Coulee. Um, there's two ponds located on private land, and 
uh, fish collected from these ponds tested as um, non hybridized West Slope, but also there was some hybrids and actually a non hybridized rainbow trout in there as well. So the headwaters are on the Forest Service, and that's another spot this year I kind of want to get into, take a look at the stream, see if we can pick up any cutthroat. If they're still non hybridized, try and find a place to replicate them. Um, Mettler Coon is kind of been identified as a potential location. It's uh, isolated from non-native fish and, and it's kind of um, it's fishless above above a, a bedrock slide um, for a short a kind of short small amount of habitat though so um, along with kind of kind of the genetic monitoring also kind of take a look this past year I've taken a look at places where we could potentially do some projects moving forward in the future um, so we poked around a couple places within the Two Madison River drainage. Um, the first uh, stream that we took a look at was Box Creek, which is uh, a trip to the South Fork Two Med just to the west of Hyde Creek. Um, we kind of did an initial habitat evaluation and, and barrier evaluation, and we found quite a, a, a few interesting things. Um, this lowermost bedrock feature uh, picture here. Um, there was uh, hybrid cutthroat from rainbows and brook trout all below, and then up above, only brook trout. So it indicates to me that it's a complete barrier to fish, uh, fish movement. And uh, as we moved upstream, we actually continued to find um, fish barriers, uh, these bedrock features that kind of help break a uh, stream system up as far as when you think of a reclamation project helps kind of make it more digestible. Um, and it kind of culminated in this spot where this, the second unnamed tributary comes in. Really cool um, place where this bedrock feature is like a double waterfall. You have the, the unnamed tributary coming in here on the, on the left. Um, we found, uh, we shocked up above here, didn't find any fish, and then um, another waterfall barrier on the main stem of Box Creek. Shocked above here, still found brook trout. So moving forward on, on Box Creek, we want to kind of continue to uh, map fish distribution within the drainage to figure out uh, just how much stream mileage brook trout are currently occupying within the system. Continue to look at the habitat, uh, monitor the temperature just to see if it's um, sufficient for West Slope cutthroat trout population, and take a look at the macro invertebrate community uh, to make sure it's a good spot if, uh, if we want to move forward with um, a restoration project here. And then similar to Box Creek, we uh, went and looked at Phillips Creek. Phillips Creek is a tributary that flows right into Swift Reservoir. Um, just about 300 meters upstream of Swift Reservoir, there's a large waterfall barrier about 40 feet high that isolates upper Phillips Creek. Um, we went above here this past year and did some backpack electrofishing in the lower mile. Uh, we didn't find any fish. It appears to be a fishless stream. And the habitat looks amazing. There's all these really deep, large, overwintering pools um, in lower Phillips Creek. Um, plenty of spawning gravels and habitat throughout. This would be an excellent place, uh, I think, to, to uh, kind of you know, replicate maybe one of the, like a mid vale population or some one of these other populations from the two medicine if we can find non-hybridized individuals. So moving forward on Phillips, we want to kind of deploy a temperature logger and make sure the temperatures are suitable uh, take a look at the macro invertebrate uh, community, and then um, this one would take some work with the working with the Forest Service. The headwaters are in the Bob Marshall wilderness area, and a lot of times, native trout conservation and wilderness character don't always see eye to eye. So we just have to really work closely with our partners and make sure you know um, we really stress uh, you know why to do a, a restoration project here, not elsewhere. Certainly not uh, anything that can't be uh, figured out. So it's kind of the uh, overall, um, I guess, theme of my talk for the Two Medicine River drainage I want to talk about today. Here's, this is my contact info if you want to uh, reach out and talk to me about anything. Um, you know, the Two Medicine is kind of a small area, or um, when you look at kind of the rest of the management area, it's, it's just this area out of all these other watersheds that we work in for West Slope Cutthroat Trout. Um, I, I kind of have, the, yeah, I'd be happy to take any questions about what I talked about or if you want to talk about, I 
have some extra slides for other stuff, um, mm -hmm. other yeah. other projects that are going Can on. Go back to your contact. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Alex. Yeah. No yeah. When you're out in the field testing to see if fish are hybridized. How does that happen? I mean, is it an instantaneous test? I wish. I, that would be amazing. Hopefully, <laughs> one day we can get there. No, so uh, we have to, when we, um, uh, we, if I can pull up a picture of a fish. Basically, when we go out and t to, to do our genetic analysis of populations, um, all we take is about a, a little clip of the fin, typically the anal fin or the top of the caudal fin. And it's uh, just we take a little snip with a piece of scissors, or with a scissors. Um, it's about the size that we're shooting for is about the size of a, a hole punch, or you know, twice that. And then uh, we take those samples when we're testing for hybridization. We like to have a sample of around 25 to 30 individuals. We try to spread that out within the drainage, so we're not just you know within uh, any given stream network. You know, the Anywhere where you're on a stream, you know, the closer you collect those fish from, the more likely they're related to each other. That's just how fish are. Um, so if you, can get, if you if you take a, like 30 samples from one section of creek and they all come back looking like they're related to each other, it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of a, a little bit of error. But that basically, yeah, we go into the streams, we take a little bit of fin tissue, and we send that to our genetics lab. Our, the state uh, genetics lab is at the University of Montana in Missoula, and um, they analyze it for us, and you know, we usually get results back in, uh, depending on when we submit them, but you know, four to six months. Um, we can do, on when we're doing like transfer projects, where we want to make sure every individual we're moving is non-hybridized, we can get an expedited kind of analysis in um, if we make that clear and we work with the lab ahead of the, uh, ahead of the transfer and they can uh, do that for us within uh, two to three days. So sometimes we, we collect a bunch of fish, we hold them and prior to a transfer, you know, we are waiting for those, those results and then once we get the green light, then we can move forward. So you don't keep track of individual fish from your first test but if they show non-hybridized, then you go and collect them and keep kind of track individuals? Yeah, we have a large database. Yeah, we don't <clears throat> typically, unless we're doing like a, like a transfer where we collect, we're gonna collect these fish for transfer and we want to uh, make sure they're all non-hybridized, then we will individually tag them all. But typically our uh, streams get monitored, you know, every like three to five years for, as far as genetic analysis on, on a, uh, Ideally, you know, in an ideal situation, there's so when I came into this position, it actually it had actually been unfilled for the past five years, so that we had hadn't had like a cutthroat trout biologist. So a lot of our genetic data is approaching that ten year old mark, where it's like especially in the two medicine river drainage, like most a lot of the most recent stuff is like 2011, and uh, um, there's a few spots that have a little more up to date genetics, but yeah, it's. It's a big task, and it's um, unfortunately, yeah, it's like another one of those things where we don't have the the means to really look at all of them, and they cost like it's like forty dollars for each individual sample to be run. So we get like an allotment for the region for about three hundred samples a year, and so yeah, that and then once we start getting above that, you know, yeah, so we kind of have to pick and choose where. So you said that they uh, swan in the fall, and then they overwinter, and then they drop in the spring. The brook trout, yeah, the non native brook trout. Um, does the temperatures make a much difference? I mean, like some of these streams will freeze over in the winter too, don't they? Maybe yeah. You get total spawning. So does it does it impact like the timing of spawning? Well, does it impact the viability? Of spawning? Oh, the I mean, you would think so, right? With like overwintering. Um, embryos and like all the things that could happen like ice scour or like if you get rain on snow and you get like a high flow event 
I wish that would happen and just totally wipe out the gun. Scary the gun. But uh, no, they're, they're incredibly adept at finding um, those areas where they'll be very successful. Char in particular, so brook trout, bull trout, um, they seem to focus in on areas of groundwater upwelling. This is less documented in trout, like rainbow trout and cutthroat trout, but char seem to really key in to areas of groundwater upwelling that you know maintain kind of a, a more stable temperature profile, a little ice, more ice free. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you are you guys actively breeding the genetically pure cutthroat at your facility in Great Falls? Like no, that's a no. That's a good. Yeah, that's a uh, something I want to kind of start developing. So we have a uh, the Washoe Park Hatchery in Anaconda. That is our West Slope Cutthroat Trout brood stock for you know stocking out recreationally for recreational populations. But they also have an isolation facility there where we can bring in you know fish from wild populations and raise them up there to outplant in other areas. Uh, unfortunately, it's like it's pretty small uh, operation, and it and those region three guys just fill it up with their <laughs> conservation projects. <laughs> so right now we kind of are pretty limited in the region, but um, you know, I this is something I kind of want to do. I kind of want to create an isolation facility at our office because I, you know, part of my master's research uh, was you know raising um, embryos, and I have a pretty good understanding of what it takes and it's, I, I think I could pull it off for, um, you know, pretty logistically simple and isolated. You know, when you talk about bringing wild fish into a hatchery, there's always these huge disease risks. So, you know, an isolation facility where they're physically just not connected to any sort of the hatchery infrastructure is the ideal way to do it. I think it's something that we can develop uh, within the region for sure. What range of water temperatures are required to keep West Slope cutthroat trout populations healthy? And will global warming warm streams enough that it will make it difficult to maintain those fish in the future? Yeah, West Slope cutthroat trout, um, they're not as narrow as species like bull trout. Their range of temper ideal temperatures, you know, are from, you know, eight on the low end to, to or I guess this would be in Celsius, but eight and to, uh, kind of 16 at the high end, and that sweet spot is like kind of right in that, that 12 to 14 uh, degrees. I don't know, I, I'm, I can't think of Fahrenheit anymore after all the science, like, I don't know what that even means anymore, but. Um, 60 to 70 degree range, basically. Yeah, yeah, in that lower, lower yeah, 60 degree range. Actually, we have a lot of populations, or uh, stream habitat um, on our, or in the, uh, I guess on Rocky Mountain Front that, um, you know, we've gone in and tried, um, so Petty Creek and the Sun River Drain, we, we did a transfer there back in the uh, early 2000s. Um, it was too cold that the fish never uh, established. It was actually too cold. And um, south, uh, the headwaters of South Badger Creek uh, is the upper four miles of that system are fishless. And it was identified as a great place to restore uh, cutthroat. Um, that system, the mean, uh, August temperature never got above seven degrees Celsius. So that system was too cold. Um, so there are places where it's too cold, but there certainly are places where it, it's getting too warm. We already have one population that we're pretty sure has uh, gone extinct uh, or been extirpated from uh, high water temperatures. That's Cow Creek in the, it's actually just uh, north of the um, Blackleaf Creek area. Um, we had a population there that, um, you know, was kind of in this uh, area, kind of hampered by, or uh, in between like beaver, a large beaver com complex, and they tested not hybridized, and we went back in the early 2000s and weren't able to find them any again. And, um, that's, but certainly, yeah, we are seeing that, and that's kind of, you know, you know, I talked a little bit about work in the wilderness and how it can be difficult, and, it's um, that kind of, that is, you know, along the Rocky Mountain Front, a great refugia. I think we are, you know, moving in under the climate scenarios that we're seeing. It is going to be uh, a lot of suitable habitat in there, but it's 
kind of comes down to, um, I don't know, I, I think it's a, a social um, issue that we run into is do, can we do native trout work in wilderness areas? Does it detract from wilderness character? We've seen just in the past couple years, actually, two large projects get, get shut down within the state um, from concerns of that. And, and that's a conversation that definitely needs to, to, needs to be had. Could you explain that further? What are yeah. the, what's that up with the wilderness? So um, there's a, a large project in the North Fork Blackfoot River that uh, uh, got uh, pulled this past year. Um, it's under litigation now. And then um, there is another project on the Buffalo Fork of Slough Creek. This is a Yellowstone Trout, Pro Trout project in Region 5. Uh, what's at odds there is these, um, so in the headwaters of the North Fork Blackfoot, for example, there's a hybridized cutthroat trout population, and they want to establish a really, and there's, there's tons of habitat above, above a, a natural barrier on the North Fork Blackfoot. And the goal of that project is to establish a cutthroat trout um, conservation population in this um, large area, and, and potentially even bull trout as well. Um, I think the, the what's at odds there is um, there's, there's folks that think that that area was historically fishless. There, there shouldn't be fish in there to begin with. Yeah. Um, and, and there are fish there now, but um, you know, moving forward with this project would just create a further draw of people to come into the wilderness and those areas are supposed to be untrammeled. And I think that's kind of where you, you see a lot of that pushback. I enjoyed learning the fact of the 14 subspecies of cutthroat trout. I'd like to go and look at pictures of all of them when I get done here. But, um, <laughs> um, like, so these um, evolutionary distributed historical ranges, like, overlapped. And uh, was there maybe, like, 20 after the Pleistocene? Or, like, are people looking at that much? Oh, yeah. Cutthroat trout systematics is going through kind of a revolution right now. Or kind of... Um, evolution of just how we think they have you know they evolved um really you know it's right now that we kind of manage it as a, a single species with 14 subspecies and even that is, is a little bit tweaked now there's actually a lot more diversity within the state of colorado that we didn't uh recognize and basically there was actually i think it was in 2018 a large group of, of cutthroat trout biologists got together uh geneticists um and, and basically they said, do we, you know, keep managing it as it is now or, because there is, it turns out, um, evidence that, you know, basically there could be actually four different species of cutthroat trout. Instead of, it, but it basically falls, it follows along the same lines as how we've been managing them, but basically there's enough diversity there to be considered four separate species uh, instead of 14 subspecies. So there would be four species, one of them would be the West Slope, one of them would be the coastal cutthroat. The other group would be the Lahontan group, which contains about four different subspecies underneath it. And the other group would be the Yellowstone group, which contains about six or eight subspecies underneath it. And is the, the Lahontan is the southern end of the continental divide? So Lahontan, the Lahontan basin is um, an in interior basin. Uh, so that's like the in Nevada, uh, kind of the Lake Tahoe, Truckee River system, Humboldt. So River. Golden. Cutthroat would probably be in, in that. Well, well so golden trout are uh, in the rainbow trout lineage. They actually, oh, they're, yeah, they, they're they're a very ancestral split off of the of rainbow trout. Um, but yeah, it's it's I find that stuff super interesting. And there's like when you look at the fossil evidence, there's fossil evidence for cutthroat in the in in the uh, Great Basin in like the Lahontan area, like 10 million years ago. And it's like, you know, we used to think that West Slope or cutthroat trout are, you know, a species of the Columbia River drainage, and, you know, it's from there they radiated out elsewhere and crossed the Continental Divide all these times. It, it could be, they're, now they're thinking maybe actually the Lahontan is actually, like, the interior Great Basin is, is kind of where they kind of all stem from, but that's, yeah, fascinating stuff. But, uh, yeah. So when I used to fish those two uh, the two med and the South Fork of two med and badger. I uh, noticed um, a lot of times that, especially later in the summer, that there's a big difference as far as algae and uh, 
and uh, and I asked Mike Ake about it years ago, you know, and and uh, he said that the two meds um, more productive than Badger is. Yeah. Um, and I wondered if um, if that algal growth was due to that or the fact that maybe it's it seems like the two meds also warmer because I've heard more about fish gills in the in the two meds here in hot summers, you know. Yeah. Um, what's your take on it? Yeah, I think those would probably go hand in hand, you know. Being slightly warmer would lead would, would lead to an actually more productive system. Um, we typically like uh, see that a lot when we look at other areas like in the little belts as well where it, you know it's more of like a basalt geography a little more volcanic you get a lot more um, yeah macrophytes aquatic plants growing uh, it just seems more productive and then when you come to a lot of these limestone drainages on the front like um, badger and uh, teton and, and uh, parts of the sun it's just very sterile there's just not a lot of nutrients it's pretty cold um, yeah, that all kind of goes hand in hand, I think. <laughs> so, what's the substrate of the two men like? Because that's like between that and Glacier. So, right. Um, I, I, and I don't, I don't have any idea what the, what the majority of those rocks are yeah. in the headwaters. I, I know on some of the tributaries, so like on Box and Hyde, it's largely it's volcanic basaltic rock that I see out there. Um, yeah, that's kind of the, kind of the bedrock that I see when I'm out there. Any other questions? Now's your chance. <laughs> Alex, this is awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Projects you're doing. I'm excited to follow up and learn some more about some of the work you guys are doing, ways we can uh, help advocate for some of that work. And yeah, it's great. So thank you so much for coming and being part of it.